and I started now to, you know, link up back up with some of my older circle who had all um, matured and developed in their own elements of business, you know. And a lot of those guys now had stepped up the crime ladder and they'd chosen, obviously, to get involved in narcotics business, which was a sort of no-brainer. And it made complete sense at that time to be able to source products in Jamaica, which wasn't hard for me to do. Um, so I never forget, actually, I went down there to um, arrange something once and um, I did obviously, we need to transfer the money from, obviously, British sterling to US dollars. That's how the trade works. And, again, I had incredible support of um, extended family, you know, it was a real combination of completely straight people to the real, you know, heavyweight criminals. And one person in particular, I'd went to see him, you know, and he left, he lived here in the 70s, he went back to Jamaica and um, became incredibly powerful. He was a smuggler. Um, he had great roots. He used to uh, smuggle a lot of cannabis at the time from Colombia, uh, Colombian gold into the States. And also he used to smuggle stuff back here. But as I said, he was a very well-respected smoker, had a great network, and also ran an illegal bank. So what it was, foreign currency was a very hard thing to obtain in Jamaica because obviously they had a, a tight hold on it. Um, Jamaica doesn't produce cars or things like that, so people when they want motor vehicles or they want luxury fridges or whatever they want or goods for their business, they have to pay in US dollars. Having a network of the main smugglers, he meant he could buy currency from them, convert them into Jamaican dollars, and he could then do business between that world and this world. See what I mean? And uh, he kind of said to me, not a problem, but what are you doing, Andrew? And I was like, I'm doing this. And he was like, you're going to get yourself killed. This is Jamaica, you know, and you're talking about running around doing this. If you're going to do this, he said, not that I want it for you, but he said, I'm going to, to school you I'm going to take you under my wing that was a huge thing because this guy was one of the most powerful smugglers in the whole of the Caribbean and he'd retired effectively you know he'd smuggled heavily in the 70s um, as I said out of Colombia he had a series of boats um, when the trade went from um, cannabis to cocaine that's when he left it and he uh, as I said just just gave it up basically you know but his understudies, they were guys who basically were happy to take the contacts in Colombia and they obviously started to get heavily involved with the cartels and smuggling the cocaine. I think in 1990s, I think 20% of the, all the cocaine in Colombia had actually was transshipped from Jamaica. So if you get an idea of what you're talking, you're talking about not just Medellin cartel or the Cali cartel, you're talking about every drop of cocaine, 20%. You're talking about hundreds of tonnes of product passing through Jamaica. I remember people buying fishing vessels because, not to catch fish, but they would go out because on the sea because they'd have these like little man-built um, submarines they'd build in Colombia, load them with coke and try to get them through, or go, go fast boats from off of the tip of um, Honduras into St. Elizabeth. But of course, when the DEA put up a helicopter or whatever, they'd throw all the stuff off. Or if the submarine would, you know, take two to, to the water, they'd float up. So you'd have hundreds, you know, some of the thousands of keys of coke just literally floating in that, part of sea so you know people that had boats would go out literally just looking for cocaine floating do you know what I mean people and were watching this now fucking getting boats <laughs> <laughs> how much was it for a Kia Coke in Jamaica back then back then okay so back then you in, in Colombia cocaine was $600 a kilo okay by the time it crossed in Jamaica you could buy cocaine in Jamaica for about 3000 US dollars a kilo and, uh, you know, so it was a, still a, a strong uh, profit mark on mm -hmm. that, you know. And obviously not as much, obviously, as places like Guyana, where there are low land boards and stuff like that. And because of Jamaica's uh, proximity to the Miami, it was obviously slightly dearer. But um, as I said, it was in abundance, you know. So it, it was the home, really, of cocaine, which was the home of marijuana prior to that, you know. And uh, I had contacts, as I said. I had people at the wharf that I do could easily, you know, send products if you need to send products. It was a question of just having people here who could then, distribute you know, it. receive it and distribute it, yeah. So there were lots of people here who'd worked in the markets, you know, and 
perishable goods every single day with traveling you know they can't get stopped really you know otherwise they'll go they'll go rotten that's the idea of perishable goods so we've got companies bringing in bananas and mangoes and yams and everything you could possibly imagine uh, there's a whole cycle a whole potential of products just coming through day in day out day in day out so it was really good for me because i could sit in jamaica you know a nice safe distance you know people could be here and it was a question of just keeping things flowing you know and that was something which was which came really really natural to do and it was fun because it was like fucking fun it was a question of a great life and you were actually separated by one and you were dealing with people in jamaica you could trust you know who were real people of serious power you know what happened here was a different story you know you got what you had to get down here you just got to take care of that side of the business and it's in their lap you know and um yeah that was the journey how that much I put were you getting shipped on. over each week i guess all right so before putting myself back in prison i'd say alleged oh. okay i'd say alleged um in the region say two thousand kilos a month of um of cocaine allegedly and in terms of cannabis perhaps maybe fourteen thousand pounds that's uh, seven and a half key um seven and a half ton yeah of uh, yeah so of proper cannabis. shipments getting sent yeah over. proper shipments yeah of course yeah how much you were know? you making see before you went done the weight the coke yeah how much were you worth then um that's a really hard question to you ask comfortable or do you know i think mean? it's a yeah i think it's a question it's hard to ask because again you know looking at pii documents and things like that when um when i was finally arrested because public interest immunity documents are what the police the dea and the different agencies you know say they've got you know and uh mad figures were put in there insane figures in 2006 um a ridiculous figure was put in a newspaper in the sunday um people rich list that had 100 million pounds which was insane figure insane figure you know but you know big figures are brands as a brand but i was making a lot of money you know just to put it in any any term you know by anyone's standard um yeah and that was it you what know what was it when like if shipments get stole or shipment gets busted because you're seeing the films you read in the books like say there's 10 shipments a month mm -hmm. people give up maybe two take those mm -hmm. two maybe a ton of coke in it let us away with the five or the ten does that happen see the game, the, the, the real game is played bigger than that, James, okay? So the real game is played that people, when people put huge amounts of drugs on boats, okay, or in containers, they're not, it's not a guessing game, okay? Customs officers, police are paid at both ends to make sure that it gets through, okay? So that's a sealed guarantee. If it falls, it's fallen by a complete accident. It's full because something has happened and something, a mishap on a computer or whatever, or another team of officers have been looking at someone, basically, and they've led a different intelligence-led operation and they've come across it or fell across it. But huge shipments like that are closed, what they call door-to-door, -door, okay? So that's how that works. So the idea of having to give away a shipment here to trick a shipment and all that, if it's playing the game on a big level, you know, you're almost guaranteed at both ends. What you're going to send is going to leave and what you're going to, you know, send is going to be received. Yeah. So every shipment that's going out, it, they're getting another pay. How, that's how the big game is yeah. played, you know. It's not a question of chance. You do have chance, don't get me wrong. You can have a, a door where you can bring stuff through and, you know, it's a company that's been running for a long time and, you know, you can throw 10 boxes on, 12 boxes, fill them with boxes of product, do you know what I mean? And you can load them up. You've got 100 key there, 200 key there, whatever. And, you know, someone might discover it. Customers might discover it. It might get dropped here. It might drop there. And those are looked at as, you know, just... You can... If you get... You can afford to lose eight, eight out of ten, do you know what I mean? And still make profit on two, you know? But when people are doing huge amounts of product, you know, those are secured. Those aren't just thrown on willy-nilly. They're not... It's not a... Um, it's not a question of chance you know yeah, too much at stake for that 20 30 40 million pounds worth too much at stake for yeah. that you know and that's that's practical mm -hmm. odds you know so yeah so that's how that game is played you know